The book of Psalms holds a unique and profound position within the Old Testament, serving as a potent testament to the individual faith of believers as they respond to the divine. John Walvoord asserts the deeply personal nature of the Psalms, accentuating how they capture the sincere responses of human hearts stirred by God's revelation through His laws, actions throughout history, and the prophecies He bestowed upon His people. This collection of poetic verses has been universally embraced by the faithful across ages, becoming a cornerstone for both corporate worship and solitary spiritual reflection. The title Psalms, or Psalter, that we are familiar with in English, has its roots in ancient Greek translations of the Hebrew Scriptures, evidenced by historical texts like the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Alexandrinus. The Greek term salmos broadly refers to melodies intended to be accompanied by the strumming of stringed instruments. However, after the translation's adaptation by early Christians, the term evolved to encompass a more generalized notion of a song of praise, with less emphasis on musical instrumentation. On the other hand, the Hebrew title for this biblical book is Seper Tehillim, meaning Book of Praises, which aptly captures the essence of its contents. This title affirms not the poetic structure, but the central theme of praise that resonates throughout the Psalms, echoing the communities and individuals' reverence and exaltations of God. Through scholarly analysis, as demonstrated by Claus Westerman, it is apparent that even Psalms of lamentation and personal entreaty unfailingly transform into expressions of praise by their conclusion, recognizing and glorifying God's power and mercy. The word tehillah, praise, may only explicitly appear once in the Psalms, but its concept is interwoven into the fabric of the Psalms, appearing in various forms within the text to highlight its significance. This focus on praising God, despite life's challenges and trials, suggests an underlying message of hope and trust that defines the collection. For centuries, believers have turned to the Psalms as a means of voicing their joys, sorrows, and hopes, finding solace in the time-honored tradition of connecting with the divine through these sacred songs and prayers. The Psalms endure as a vital source of spiritual sustenance and an everlasting channel for the faithful to offer their adoration to God. Also, Walvoord's examination of the book of Psalms places it within the context of the Hebrew Bible, where it resides in the third part known as the Writings. This positioning contrasts with English translations, which follow the Greek and Latin traditions, organizing the scriptures in a manner reflecting thematic and chronological criteria rather than the Hebrew structure. The Psalms themselves are treasured as an expansive anthology of religious lyric poetry, unparalleled in its antiquity and profundity. Lyric poetry is distinct for its intimate expression of the poet's emotions, and when framed within the context of the Old Testament, these emotions are inherently intertwined with spirituality. The fundamental nature of religious lyric poetry, as A.F. Kirkpatrick notes, involves the poet's emotional response to the concept of God, directed worshipfully toward him. The poetic verses within the Psalms serve as vehicles for a spectrum of spiritual sentiment that engage directly with the divine. These include supplications, laments, praises, and thanksgivings that articulate the believer's innermost fears, moments of uncertainty, victory celebrations, and peaks of joy. Authors of the Psalms draw upon personal situations to reflect universal human needs and to testify to divine grace and steadfastness. In doing so, the Psalms provided solace and encouragement to the faithful, as well as serve as a reminder against the perils of faithlessness and rebellion. Moreover, the Psalms are didactic, often rejoicing in the law of God, which they esteemed as a guide for ethical behavior and a pathway to prosperity. Multiple Psalms echo the wisdom tradition of Israel, resonating with the moral teachings consistent with other wisdom literature, like the Book of Proverbs. Being integral to temple worship, the Psalms celebrate religious ceremonies and exult in the intimate experience of communion with God in a sacred setting. Their lyrical form and rich emotional content make them unforgettable and emblematic of ancient Israel's religious life. Furthermore, the Psalms provide a vivid depiction of the Israelites as a devout people with a strong moral compass who saw themselves as participants in a covenant with God. This covenantal identity opposed wickedness and unbelief and infused their daily lives, celebrations, and even military undertakings with a sense of divine purpose and religious sanctity. Hence, the Psalms have been cherished ensuring their continued relevance and capacity to edify believers of all generations within the household of faith. In addition, 
Walvoord indicates the nuanced and evocative nature of this form of expression. Lyric poetry stands distinct from other literary genres through its dense concentration of artistic elements such as imagery, symbols, emotive language, and the usage of multiple meanings within a single expression. This form invites a reader to experience language as an art that conveys layers of emotional and intellectual meaning. In Psalms, the imagery is notably reflective of the Israelite culture, which was intimately connected with the land and its agrarian lifestyle, as well as its history of frequent military encounters. This connection to nature and conflict is evident in the vivid descriptions and metaphors used throughout the poetic text. For instance, a godly individual is likened to a tree flourishing beside streams of water, capturing both a sense of vitality and resilience. Such metaphors are not just picturesque but are imbued with emotional resonance, inviting readers to feel the strength and serenity associated with the godly life described. When understanding the Psalms as religious lyric poetry, it's crucial to delve into the emotive world the psalmists constructed. The poetry is not just about cognitively understanding the notions of fear, courage, or divine presence, but rather feeling the trembling of the faint-hearted or the steadfastness of the faithful through the potent images invoked. Thus, the psalms communicate in a manner that transcends intellectual comprehension, reaching for a more profound, effective understanding. Further, Walvoord outlines the different types of psalms as signified by their headings, which provide insights into their composition and function. Ms. Moore labels 57 psalms that are songs typically accompanied by stringed instruments. Sir indicates a general song and is found in 12 psalms. Maskell is thought to represent a reflective or contemplative poem and is attached to 13 psalms. Mictum, which appears with six psalms, has been interpreted as epigram or engraved saying in later contexts, though its precise definition remains a subject of scholarly debate. Additionally, the collection includes psalms designated as prayers, tepila, and there is a singular instance of a psalm labeled praise, tehila, which is Psalm 145. These categories serve not only as historical and liturgical pointers, but also enrich the interpretive framework for readers and scholars to comprehend the diverse roles and themes encapsulated in the Psalms. Besides, Walvoord maintains the intricate nature of poetic craftsmanship evident in this collection of biblical hymns. He points out that the Psalms stand out for their rich patterns, intentional design, and a profound sense of unity, balance, harmony, and variation, all hallmarks of a deliberate creative effort. For the psalmists, the artistic expression was not merely ornamental, but fundamental to the transmission of the psalm's deep theological and emotional content. Walvoord acknowledges the specific element of meter as critical to the art form of poetry and by extension to the psalms. He reiterates the presence of meter and rhythm within Hebrew poetry, a feature that is universally recognized but elusively defined within this ancient context. Hebrew poetry's meter terms have largely been lost to history or have become difficult to understand within the modern framework of linguistic analysis, posing a unique challenge to scholars and theologians seeking to fully appreciate the original rhythmic structure of these sacred songs. Most contemporary analyses of the psalm's meter focus on the accents of the Hebrew language, specifically the count of accented words or word units in each poetic line. This method offers a semblance of the psalm's rhythmic pattern, but inevitably falls short in capturing the entirety of the psalm's original metrical scheme. Walvoord observes that attempts to apply consistent metrical patterns across all psalms often prove futile, as only a subset seems to follow a regular metric convention consistently. He finds that attempts to retrofit the psalms into new or innovative metrical patterns can lead to interpretations that feel inauthentic, or that impose structures that were not intended by the original authors. Through his analysis, Walvoord calls for a balanced approach to understanding the psalm's meter, one that respects the text's inherent complexity and historical context. He cautions against the overzealous application of contemporary metrical models to these ancient hymns, which can distort their intended artistry and meaning. Instead, he invites readers to engage with the psalms appreciatively and thoughtfully, fully aware that their complete poetic and rhythmic essence may be partly obscured by the passage of time and the limitations of our modern understanding. Additionally, Walvoord offers a detailed examination of the structural elements that define Hebrew poetic tradition, with a particular emphasis on the concept of parallelism, a literary tool intrinsic to biblical verse. He provides a taxonomy of parallelism forms, 
each delineating a nuanced relationship within and between poetic lines to elucidate the text's thematic intentions and bolster its emotive power. At the heart of Hebrew poetry, synonymous parallelism stands out for its mirroring of ideas between successive lines, offering a repetition of comparable terms that serve to reinforce the initial statement. This echoes and amplifies the message for emphasis, while also enabling poetic conciseness. Antithetical parallelism, in contrast, operates through contrasts, presenting opposing concepts that draw attention to the differences between them, thus sharpening the reader's understanding of each idea through the starkness of their juxtaposition. Emblematic parallelism, for its part, weaves metaphor into the verse, illuminating abstract thoughts through concrete imagery, thereby fusing the literal with the figurative to shed light on theological and existential concepts in an approachable manner. This method can deepen understanding by offering tangible associations with intangible ideas. Also, Walvoord notes that these poetic lines do not always adhere to a strict syntactic conformity. Rather, they can present variations such as chiastic structures, which involve an inversion of word order that can add complexity and texture to the poetry. Moreover, he discusses incomplete parallelism, which occurs when not all terms between lines find a counterpart. This can take the form of incomplete parallelism with compensation, where the lack of one-to-one -one correspondence between terms is offset by a balanced number of terms overall, sometimes expressed through climactic repetition and incomplete parallelism without compensation, where the discrepancy in term matching goes unaddressed. Some verses exhibit a form of continuation or all compensation, where the second line simply extends the thought of the first, which Walvoord suggests is more akin to a formal structure than traditional parallelism. This approach may alternatively be seen as synthetic parallelism, a label that accommodates a broader interpretation of the relationship between lines, where the second line develops the idea started by the first, rather than mirroring or contrasting it directly. Furthermore, Walvoord repeats that parallelism is not only an internal feature within verses, but can also manifest externally, between verses, intertwining them and adding a layer of complexity to the overarching poetic design. Recognizing and understanding these varieties of parallelism, he debates, is crucial for a comprehensive engagement with the text, allowing readers to fully experience the richness, depth, and artistic craftsmanship encoded in biblical poetry. In addition, Walvoord's analysis of the Psalms' stylistic arrangements sheds light on the sophisticated literary structures within biblical poetry particularly underlining the use of stanzas or strophes and acrostic patterns. He notes that, unlike most other biblical poetry, certain psalms are organized into stanzas or strophes, with Psalm 119 being the most prominent example. This psalm is distinctively structured into 22 strophes, each containing eight verses, corresponding to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. This arrangement not only adds to the aesthetic and structural complexity of the psalm, but also likely serves a mnemonic function, facilitating memorization. Further, Walvoord discusses the use of refrains within these strophic structures, which are repetitive phrases or lines used to divide and underscore the poem's thematic or emotional shifts. He cites examples from Psalms 42, 43, 57, and 80, where refrains punctuate the poetic discourse, marking out strophes and enhancing the rhythmic and thematic coherence of the Psalms. The acrostic pattern is another stylistic feature Walvoord explores, where successive verses or sets of verses start with consecutive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. He identifies several psalms, 910, 25, 34, 37, 111, 112, 145, that employ this technique, with Psalm 119 being the most elaborate example. In Psalm 119, each of the 22 sections begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and every verse in a section starts with the same letter. This not only demonstrates a high level of artistic craftsmanship, but also serves as an aid to memory, making the psalms easier to recall and recite. Walvoord's insights emphasize the psalms' complexity and artistic beauty, reflecting a deep understanding of their form and function within the biblical canon. These stylistic arrangements contribute to the psalms' memorability, aesthetic appeal, and spiritual depth, demonstrating the deliberate and inspired craftsmanship of their composers. Besides, Walvoord's examination of music and melody in the Psalms of Israel reveals a sophisticated and integral role of music in religious worship. 
the psalms are rich with references to a variety of musical instruments, including cymbals, timbrels, wind, and stringed instruments, suggesting an elaborate and grand musical accompaniment in worship practices. These instruments, coupled with the frequent mention of to the choir master in 55 psalms, point to a structured and significant role of music directors or chief musicians likely overseeing temple music and indicating the psalm's use in formal religious service. The references to specific families or guilds, such as the Sons of Korah and Jeduthun, accentuate a professional class of musicians, suggesting a tradition of musical expertise and heritage. Additionally, this is evidenced by the various musical terms used in the headings and texts of the psalms, such as nejino for stringed instruments and seminate for an eight-stringed lute, indicating the use of specific instruments or tunes in worship. Sela, a term found within many psalms, though its precise meaning remains debated, likely indicates a liturgical or musical direction, possibly a pause or emphasis in the musical or worship service. Additionally, the psalms contain specific melody indicators, suggesting that certain psalms were sung to particular tunes or thematic settings, reflecting the varied and rich musical culture of ancient Israel. Overall, Walvoord's insights paint a picture of a deeply musical worship environment in ancient Israel, where music was not just an accompaniment, but a critical component of religious expression and community identity, showcasing a complex array of instruments, roles, and musical notations that enrich our understanding of the biblical texts. Also, Walvoord provides a comprehensive examination of the traditional attribution of the Psalms to David, notably through the lamed preposition, for example, Ledawid of David, found in many of the superscriptions. He acknowledges the modern skepticism surrounding these attributions based on various historical, grammatical, and theological arguments. Despite the debates, Walvert affirms that the scriptural and historical records do not dismiss David as a composer of sacred songs and an organizer of liturgical music, asserting his established role in Israel's musical and worship traditions. The core of the debate lies in the interpretation of the lamed preposition. While it is versatile and can imply authorship, dedication, or other relationships, Walvoord highlights that its usage as an indicator of authorship is supported by evidence from Northwest Semitic inscriptions and comparative Semitic linguistics, as well as other biblical passages. However, he insists that each psalm should be considered on its own merits, with its superscription interpreted in light of the psalm's internal evidence and the broader usage of the preposition. Moreover, Walvoord addresses the skepticism towards the psalm's antiquity and authorship, advocating for a balanced view that recognizes the tradition of Davidic authorship while considering the critical questions posed by modern scholarship. He indicates the need for thorough examination of the evidence, citing the respect given to these superscriptions by New Testament figures. He provides a tabulation of the psalms attributed to various authors, from Moses to Solomon, indicating the span of their composition from early Israelite history to the post-exilic period. Furthermore, he notes the historical superscriptions that link several psalms to specific events in David's life, as recorded in Samuel and Chronicles. In summary, Walvoord navigates the complex debate on psalms' authorship with a view that honors both the traditional attributions and the necessities of critical inquiry advocating for a discerning approach to understanding these ancient texts' origins and significance. In addition, Walvoord dives into the intricate process of the Psalter's formation, maintaining the complex historical and liturgical context out of which the biblical psalms emerged. He points out that the psalms' authorship and compilation spanned an extended period, marking various stages and contributions from different figures, particularly Israelite kings and leaders known for their religious reforms. The initial collection likely began with King David, renowned for organizing temple worship. David's own psalms formed a core collection, as indicated by the editorial note in Psalm 72. Despite this early collection, subsequent psalms were still attributed to David, suggesting that the compilation was an ongoing process. Following David, kings like Solomon, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and Josiah made significant contributions by reorganizing temple music and musical guilds. These reforms often involved re-establishing Levitical roles in temple worship, with specific references to singing the words of David and Asaph, indicating that multiple collections of psalms were recognized and used. The psalms were not just the work of these historical figures, but were also shaped by the Levites and other authors, 
resulting in a diverse and rich hymn book. Not all ancient songs found their way into the Psalter, as Walvoord reiterates, including notable omissions like the songs of Moses, Miriam, Deborah, and Jonah. The Psalter's final form is divided into five books, each concluding with a doxology, with the entire collection ending in a grand doxology in Psalm 150. The existence of this fivefold division is supported by evidence from the Qumran scrolls. The final stage of the Psalter's formation reflects the work of a final editor who arranged these individual and group collections without a single unifying theme, repeating the Psalter's role as a comprehensive worship and reflection tool for the Israelite community by the close of the Old Testament canon. Further, Walvoord's analysis of the Psalms text digs into the complexities and variations among the three primary text types, the Masoretic text, MT, the Greek Septuagint, LXX, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. He regards the MT as the superior version, underlining its preservation of archaic, rare, or difficult readings as evidence of the scribe's reverence and commitment to maintaining the integrity of the text. Despite this, he acknowledges that translators and commentators have sometimes made emendations to the MT to resolve perplexing passages, underscoring the need for careful scrutiny of such changes to ensure they don't detract from the original meaning. The Greek Septuagint, while a pivotal text in the history of biblical translations, is considered by Walvoord to be based on an inferior textual tradition compared to the MT. He notes that the LXX often simplifies or alters the more complex Hebrew readings, affecting the translation's accuracy and character. This smoothing over of textual difficulties in the LXX influenced many subsequent English translations, which relied heavily on the Greek text. Significant attention is given to the differing psalm numbering between the MT and the LXX, a disparity that can lead to confusion in citation and interpretation, especially when consulting various commentaries or translations. The absence of verse superscriptions in the Greek and English versions further complicates this issue, often resulting in a mismatch of verse numbers compared to the Hebrew. Besides, Walvoord touches upon the psalms found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, noting them as another witness to the text, but also inferior to the MT. His analysis emphasizes the importance of understanding these textual nuances and variations in scholarly work and translation efforts, advocating for a cautious and informed approach when dealing with the ancient and revered text of the Psalms. This nuanced understanding is crucial for accurate interpretation and appreciation of the Psalms in their original linguistic and cultural context. Additionally, Walvoord's analysis of the study of Psalms reflects the evolution of biblical scholarship and methodologies over time. Initially, the study was dominated by conservative scholars who relied on historical and grammatical commentaries from authors like J. A. Alexander and Franz Delitzsch. These works provided foundational interpretations, but sometimes speculated beyond direct evidence. A notable shift occurred with the literary analytical method, as represented by C. A. Briggs. This approach affirmed the Psalms' theological ideas, poetic structure, and philology, suggesting a later Maccabean period for most Psalms. While offering a fresh perspective, this dating was significant as it shifted understanding of the Psalms' origins and purposes. However, it was Hermann Gunkel's form critical method that marked a pivotal turn in Psalm study. Gunkel suggested that Psalms were integrally connected to Israel's worship rituals, each Psalm arising from specific liturgical contexts. This method focused on categorizing the psalms into types based on shared features like vocabulary, mood, and form, leading to the identification of various categories, including laments, thanksgivings, and hymns. Despite its contributions to understanding the psalm's structure and function, form criticism faced criticism for its tendency to view most psalms as priestly and liturgical, possibly underestimating their personal and communal aspects. Nonetheless, Walvoord acknowledges the significant benefits of this approach, particularly in its systematic categorization of psalms that enhances comprehension and interpretive depth. Walvoord's discussion particularly asserts individual laments, detailing their structure from the initial cry to God to the concluding vow of praise. This structure illustrates the psalm's deep emotional range and theological richness, reflecting a dynamic relationship between the individual and the divine. Through these scholarly methods, the Psalms are seen not just as ancient texts, but as living documents that continue to speak to spiritual experiences across ages. Also, Walvoord distinguishes between national laments and thanksgiving psalms, 
highlighting their structure and spiritual significance in the biblical context. National laments are community prayers expressing sorrow and seeking divine help. Unlike individual laments, these are shorter but follow a similar pattern. An address and petition to God, a description of the nation's distress, lament, a declaration of trust in God, a plea for His intervention, and a vow to praise Him upon deliverance. These psalms reflect the collective spirituality of a nation in crisis as the community gathers to express their dependence on God's mercy and power. They demonstrate the communal aspect of faith, where the people of God unite in their adversity to seek hope and salvation from the divine. Thanksgiving psalms, or psalms of declarative praise, present a different dynamic. They begin with a resolution to praise God, often intended to publicize the Lord's deeds. An introductory summary briefly states God's deliverance, followed by a detailed account of the trouble from which the psalmist was rescued. This narrative typically includes a cry for help, God's merciful response, and the resulting deliverance. The psalm concludes with a renewed commitment to praise God, and often a section of teaching or direct praise, offering insights or moral lessons derived from the psalmist's experiences. These psalms serve as personal testimonies of God's saving acts, encouraging the community to trust and glorify God. Walvoord's analysis indicates the psalm's role in instructing, encouraging, and shaping the worship practices of the faithful. National laments communalize suffering and divine petitioning, while thanksgiving psalms celebrate and bear witness to God's faithfulness and intervention. Both forms enrich the spiritual life of believers, offering avenues for lamentation, thanksgiving, and teaching within the communal and individual faith journey. Moreover, Walvoord delineates various types of psalms, with a specific focus on descriptive praise psalms. These hymns are distinct in their focus on extolling God directly, rather than maintaining personal stories of salvation. Structurally, they consist of an invitation to praise, followed by a justification for such praise, often elucidating God's magnificence and gracious acts, culminating in a further call to worship. Walvoord's exposition extends beyond descriptive praise psalms to include other categories like wisdom psalms, pilgrim psalms, royal psalms, and enthronement psalms, each with distinctive features and functions. Wisdom psalms parallel Old Testament wisdom literature, providing moral instruction and reflection on the dichotomy between the righteous and wicked. Pilgrim psalms, identified as songs of ascents, are believed to accompany the pilgrimage to Jerusalem for holy festivals. Royal psalms center around moments in the life and duties of the monarch, such as coronations, weddings, or battles, often reflecting messianic expectations. Enthronement psalms, characterized by declarations of God's royal authority, have invited varied interpretations. Some propose they related to a yearly festival celebrating God's sovereignty. Others contest this view due to a lack of explicit scriptural support. The interpretation of enthronement psalms has propelled modern scholars towards a cultic perspective, deriving largely from form-critical methodology. This school of thought, represented by figures like Sigmund Movinkel, suggests that an annual autumn festival involved the ritualistic enthronement of the Lord. However, the evidence for such rituals is tenuous, often inferred from analogous practices among neighboring cultures, leading some scholars to question this approach. Walvoord reiterates the importance of understanding the Psalms within the context of worship in ancient Israel, contending that such recognition can enhance modern readers' comprehension. He notes that certain Psalms include superscriptions indicating liturgical usage, for example, during temple dedications, the Sabbath, or other offerings. Furthermore, he repeats that the Psalms were used both in community worship during significant religious festivals and by individuals for personal petitions. Conclusively, Walvoord posits that Psalms nurture believers' confidence in God to such an extent that supplication seamlessly transitions into gratitude. He advocates that partaking in God's blessings and publicly declaring them was not only an act of worship, but also a means to communal enrichment. The Psalms, according to Walvoord, invite the faithful to indulge in and express their joy in God's provisions, cementing a culture of praise as an essential part of living a faithful life. Last but not least, Walvoord's exploration of the theological richness of the Psalms unveils the complexities of capturing a distinct theology within its verses due to the Psalms' wide-ranging religious content. Nevertheless, the centrality of God's sovereign rule and the expectation of His just governance on earth pervades the text.
the psalmists, in their adversity, eagerly anticipate God's righteous intervention and vindication. In their spiritual conflict with evil and their pushback against pagan influences, the psalmists affirm their deep loyalty to God's covenant and express their desire for His will through prayers, including imprecations against their foes. These shouldn't be seen as personal animosities but rather a fervent plea for divine justice. The theological stance of the psalmist influences their worship practices. They demonstrate their conviction in God's theocratic rule, which extends into their anticipation of a messianic age. Although the details of God's revelation may not have been fully clear, their expectation of divine rectification was strong. The psalmist's perspective on life and afterlife is complex. While they yearned for God's deliverance and experienced His love and righteousness in life, their notions about the afterlife are not explicit. There are allusions to continued relationship with God beyond death, but these are open to interpretation and are later developed in further scriptural revelations. The Messianic Psalms, in particular, are seen retrospectively through the lens of Jesus Christ's New Testament fulfillment. Walvoord underlines careful exegesis, recognizing that the Psalms had immediate relevance to their authors, while some expressions prophetically anticipate Christ. Furthermore, Walvoord categorizes messianic psalms into various types, from purely prophetic to typically messianic, each with varying degrees of messianic anticipation. These psalms have not only provided the framework for understanding Jesus' role as the Messiah, but have also offered believers through the ages a means of expressing worship, seeking comfort, and engaging with the divine. The transition from lamentation to praise within the psalms underscores the psalmist's assured faith in God's responsiveness to their prayers and their assurance of his forthcoming actions. In conclusion, Walvoord provides a comprehensive analysis that explores the psalm's unique place within the Hebrew Bible and the larger context of biblical literature. He recognizes the psalms as a diverse collection of heartfelt human responses to God's revelation, laws, and actions in history, with their content spanning a full range of human emotions and spiritual experiences. The psalms have been central to both personal devotion and corporate worship, offering words for joys, sorrows, and hopes that resonate with believers across different eras. In addition, Walvoord emphasizes that the Psalms emerged from a rich tradition of religious lyric poetry, characterized by poignant expressions of individual and collective spiritual life. Each Psalm, unique in tone and theme, varies from expressions of deep despair to exaltations of praise often originating from personal situations that transcend to address universal human needs. Further, the authorship of the Psalms, traditionally linked to King David, is discussed in light of modern scholarship with some skepticism. Walvoord disputes these concerns, providing historical context and suggesting a measured approach that acknowledges Davidic influence while considering contemporary critical investigation. Besides, in his exploration of the Psalms' formation, Walvoord indicates that the process was gradual, with contributions and compilations occurring over centuries. While many psalms were composed by David and other notable kings associated with religious reform, these sacred songs also underwent editorial processes that led to their final canonical form. Additionally, scholarly methodologies, from historical grammatical to form critical, have shaped the understanding of the psalms allowing for the categorization and in-depth study of their content, rhetoric, and theological messages. Walvoord accentuates the essential role of music in psalms, noting the abundance of references to instruments and terms suggestive of the structured role of music in the temple worship of Israel. Lastly, theologically, the psalms depict a prevailing anticipation of God's righteous rule. They manifest a covenantal thrust, where the faithfulness and judgment of God are key motifs and the plea for justice against foes echoes this central theme. In summary, Walvoord's examination of the Psalms demonstrates their enduring value and complexity as part of Scripture. He offers readers a detailed understanding of their poetic artistry, historical development, and the deep theological threads that weave through this prized collection of ancient hymns.